Let's go. Hello, the channel. Welcome back, Mike. How are you doing? Thanks very much for coming back on the channel again. Very good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here on a Monday afternoon. I know. That's an unusual one to um, record, although with, by the time this all downloads and I make a complete mess of pressing the buttons and stuff, it'll probably be Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Um, yeah, thanks very much for coming on. So we've done a few of these now and actually they've been pretty popular. So, so I do appreciate you coming on and um, last couple, couple of ones we've been discussing going through things, numbers and everything. I thought it would be a good idea just to get a catch up and just have a chat about generally where, where so rare is that just now and um, in my own head I'm trying to spit, um, find some sort of thinking space about what my strategy and everything um, is going forward. So I thought we'd maybe just ha having a chat about um, how you're feeling about it at the moment and um, yep. we'll sort of go from there. Usually we, we end up to say we'll have like four or five topics and we're like an hour into the video and it's like we've done like two of the topics so let's not get too ambitious and then we'll, we'll see how we go from there sounds good sounds good yeah i think i'm I'm probably pretty similar to yourself uh you know in terms of scratching my head in terms of of strategy or or where do we go next and i think you know obviously last week we had the prize pools update which gives us a bit more insight into what's going on but um yeah and with everything happening with with eth and crypto sort of you know uh, peaking or, or doing a lot better than it has been so uh, there, there's a lot of factors to sort of take into consideration when it when you think about okay what's my next step here what am i going to do now yeah it's an interesting one because obviously we've, we've chatted about that a few times as well with like f rising and and all that type of stuff and i think i think there's some some unhidden benefits of that as well and that you're not seeing the benefits because all the 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 so rare prizes are now sort of pegged to fiat. So if anybody yeah. stumbles across this video like a few years ago, then the prizes used to be like seen as an Ethereum. And if if Ethereum had really risen over the course of a game week, you would if it in effect make more money if you were sort of normal pounds or euros value. Whereas now everything's you know pegged to um pounds and dollars, etc. So you don't don't really see the benefit but i think there are some unhidden benefits in the background when you see maybe guys like flow state or guys like pranksy etc putting money in and, and spending that in the platform as well because obviously they're maybe taking a sort of exit point in some of their ethereum and saying well this is like doubled over the last couple of months i'm going to lock some of that in and i'm gonna gonna buy some so rare cards to can almost buy some income like play for for those cash prizes and everything that's coming up so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that, it's a good point. You know, like entries and exit points of of any sort of type of investment, um, and and you know, like you say, like ETH. I think I I posted about it on Twitter last week as well in terms of of how how it's almost definitive now or definitive now that you know the majority of users on so rare are are predominantly valuing in fiat over ETH. Right? If you look at the market volumes, if you look at the trading, if you look at what's going on. ETH movement doesn't really matter to people. They'll still pay if a card they think is worth a hundred bucks, they pay a hundred bucks. Um, and, and so if you're clever or smart with that in terms of that extra little lever of ETH moving either direction, you can, uh, you know, you can be quite smart and, and, you know, earn a little extra on top potentially. Yeah. I think the thing is there's so many different settings as well. So I went in the other day to check my own settings to see because um, because like I'm basically I'm gonna mug punch out on them this week. And I was like, if I went into this weekend, well, I'll just take some fiat and just whack it into the bank account. And do like there's there's different settings like inherently where you can peg even your listings to Ethereum, or you can mm, yeah. you can have it as different ways. So yeah, I mean, even thinking back, like when Limited came out, they were always like they they became quite fiat valued predominantly quite quickly. I think, but you know, obviously yeah. like rare and above and everything used to be linked valuations wise to what what you know <laughs> scary word thresholds um but like you know with things like that people would 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 tend to think about card values in terms of what they could win across a number of game weeks and if you had thresholds that weren't pegged to fiat values etc then that made a difference i mean it's it's such a it, i mean people are still talking about mm -hmm. a bull market and everything for crypto but like for me looking at the financial backdrop and stuff it it's a weird one because I'm kind of looking at it and saying, like, is is this a really bullish point? Are we would you maybe a pullback or is it just gonna keep keep going 
mad type thing. You just you just don't know it's so volatile. Nah, um, nah, nah. And, that, and, that, and that's it. It's, it is. It's still very volatile, isn't it? You know, and that's 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 what draws people to it. You know, the risk reward is is significant and it's and it's volatile. Um, I actually, going back to what you were just saying a second ago, I think I went to try and buy a card last week, and I had no cash balance. I only had ETH in my account, and or I had too small a cash balance for the card I was trying to get. And um, I went to place an offer, and the first like three people on the market I couldn't offer because I would only accept cash of the of that card. You know, the three lowest that were there. And yeah. I was just like, geez, I actually forgot about that. You know, so I only introduced that. I think what was it, May last year, maybe, where the cash wallet was introduced. So it hasn't even been a year, and now there are. I'd love to understand, you know, how many people are open to both sides, cash or ETH, or how many people are only trading in ETH or only trading in cash. I think that'd be really interesting to see, you know. But I think uh, I would strongly recommend everyone to be open to both, you know. Like if if you want the if you want a liquid fluid market and if you want to be able to do deals either way, have yourself open to both. I think that that split wallet thing is one of the most annoying things on so rare at the moment. Like, mm. so yeah, I don't like, I, I've been spending because I feel like there's actually value around and we'll see whether or not it has actually value or not. But like, is that when you've, you've got like, say you've got 60 quid or something, you've got 60 quid or something else, you go and you see something at 80 quid and you can't buy it, you can't combine your, um, yeah. your money and stuff and the, the fiat wallet's good. But like, obviously in the UK anyway, if you, you take your, money out it takes maybe four or five days to hit your account now it's 25 pence for the withdrawal so that's magic but at the end of the day unless you have a fund or a float there or whatever where you can say well i can go into ramp and buy the f here or whatever then just doesn't work and like, i think like one of the main things so i can do to help market liquidity would be to find a way to abstract that a bit more so like if, if you go and you you buy on the market or whatever i don't know what they actually ultimately sort of take, etc. But if you if you go buy at an auction, you can pay with Ethereum or you can pay with cash, and then they're doing whatever they do with that in the background. So if they could also do what they're doing with that for the secondary market, it would help a lot. Or even if you could imagine, like if you had your sixteen, your sixteen, you could combine that and buy something at hundred and twenty. Like you know, like yeah. that would that would be so much better and. You know, it leads on to the other stuff that I think we we'll want to discuss. We were talking about this example of like how expensive the new MLS cards are, even as a multiplier in the same scarcity to the older cards. Um, and you know, it seems a bit bonkers to see like a Mickey Yamani sitting at sixty quid, if that's how you value it. Um, but seeing the auctions going to like two fifty and three hundred and stuff and you're yeah, thinking, you know, what's causing this and where, where is the value there? Is the value in the classic cards? Is it the value in the new cards? Or is it um, just that, you know, that's the going rate for the new cards at the moment and maybe the with this new system of old cards winning new cards, with it not properly being actually introduced yet, will those older cards start to catch up as people are effectively maybe priced out the new cards? So that... That's yeah. quite hard to get your head around all that sort of stuff. And it's like, I, I mean, and, and that's you know definitely what like I'm saying, you know, in terms of strategy of, of deciding what to do, you know, it's 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 not making things easier. You know, like you say that Yamane example, and there was a few others I think I'd seen on Twitter the last couple of days of of uh, you know new MLS cards, like you say, five x what the what you can get a what you can get an old season one for. Yeah. I mean, I. You know, I sort of wrote about it last week in terms of that sort of whole paradox of aggregation stuff and and how how people need to and again, you know, it depends how you look at it through the lens, right? There's collection bonuses, there's the fun element, there's the whatever. But my fear is that those who are spending, in my eyes, a little bit over the odds initially in these first few minutes of of certain cards for MLS. Are just going to get burnt and, and are the same people that might complain in six months whenever so rare have minted so many more of of that player of that card and yeah. the price is 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 you know taking the taking a fairly steep downward trend i mean so rare i think it's on them again what we spoke about a while ago in terms of potentially using that instant buy a little bit in a better way or or you know yeah. releasing releasing more cards earlier in the season to sort of spread that risk a little bit 
Um, of course, everyone wants to be first mover. And of course, the price is purely based upon demand. You know, you're only going to pay X, you know, the, the, the next level up from what someone else was willing to pay for that card. But there aren't, in my eyes right now, there aren't enough buyers around. When people see the new price pools coming out, there aren't enough buyers around to sustain those prices for, for a significant long period of time. Um, and the, the other way to look at it is, does it, you know, does it gradually trend downwards? Or does it remain pretty flat up until one point in the season where there's only 10 games left or even at the end of the season and it just falls off a cliff? You know, because then are they are they 5X now and then at the end of the season they're, they're, they're still a classic card? So do they gradually go 4, 3, 2X or do they just go 5X down to zero right away? Do you know? Yeah. Not down to zero, but down to the same price as classics. Yeah. I, I think that's really interesting. I think the other thing is that so rare, this is a new experience for so rare. So how many they yeah. release might have to be tailored to that, and people won't want to hear this if they've just bought their their collections in MLS. But maybe so rare need to release more just now to soften that curve. So like maybe oh. it'd be better if there was a smaller price disparity and so rare sold more of them, and that allows people to compete in competitions. So one thing I would just take it slightly away from that five X thing and everything, but. One thing I really liked was that when Soria talked about bringing out the MLS special, they said, well, rather than doing this four and one of new season or in season cards for limited and rare, they said, we're going to do three and two. So then, in effect, actually, you know, if you think that Mickey Yamani or whoever you think is really good or whatever, and you know, you might want to include them as your classic season part of that because yeah. if you're giving out $50,000 per game week for three game weeks to get things a kick start then for me the obvious value would be the other cards but then you're going to have to then pair them with three new cards so you've got to factor in what you're spending yeah. on them. but I, I actually i actually that, that i didn't read that one in detail is it 50k per game week or is it like a cumulative score over the three game weeks it said you know, like long yeah it said 150k over three game weeks so i don't know if it's um if they're going to divide it into prize pools per game week, because they never, yeah. in, in typical Soria fashion, they just said 150k, so they didn't say whether it was 50k yeah. for first or it was a thousand for yeah. first, you know. But, um, I mean, it, fair play, I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's creating some demand for the cards, and even I know yeah. some guys who are saying, um, hope, you know, hopefully the J League cards are out as soon as they're old, they've given a prize pool for the J League yeah. one, so you know. They, they, they surely must be they must be planning to get them out soon so so the, the positive of it is we're always talking about obviously so they're bringing demand and bringing prizes towards cards to, to make them valuable and i guess that um they have done that I, the only mitigating factor i can see with the secondary market is that obviously the problems of secondary market just now is a liquidity problem because yeah. they've, they've reduced the threshold payouts at the moment and it's going to be replaced by giving these cash comps, but there's a gap in that because the, the main cash comps out with the EPL haven't actually started yet. So you've got a couple of weeks and then those amounts of money will start going in the system. The other thing as well is that when you've got an illiquid market, as a kind of illiquid, what, what people tend to do then is chase the cash. And the best yeah. way to chase the cash at the moment is to buy new cards because then you're not competing with all the classic cards. So... You know, if somebody's got a balance just now or whatever, as soon as those new cards start coming out, it's like, how, how is the best way for me to win now? I agree with you. Like, you see some of those cards going for two and 300 quid. You think that's, you know, that's quite high, but um, mm -hmm. it's going to be a mind-boggling one. But I remember years ago, there was always a point in the summer where if I had existing MLS cards and they were going for a certain amount, I would then look at what cards were going for in Europe and start actually working towards the next season, thinking... You know, Walker Zimmerman's 200 quid here. I can get, you know, a, a Napoli defender at that point where they were doing really well for the same price. So, should I maybe be trading out of that to buy somebody yeah. else that level, you know? Um, because yeah. it's, it's all it's all so so new, this new sort of system of it. But I guess, I mean, it we, I, I was I wasn't that overly impressed with the overall amounts in the divisions, but for the cash, but I think what they've done quite well is they've spread it over the different divisions. Um, so like if you look at contender, I think like rare was thousand dollars for first. So yeah. 
thousand dollars, a thousand dollars. Um, and it's not, it doesn't seem overly exciting when you look at maybe how much the prices of some of the rare cards were in the past. So you could win a Joey Veerman and Joey Veerman worth at least a thousand himself and all that type of stuff. But then they have spread it over all the different divisions. So, like, you know, you've got the second division that still get a significantly good first prize. So, how will that um play out? And that will the cards fly in terms of the top level cards? But then will people realize that actually in their division three or whatever that they play in, that their tier twos and their tier ones are actually much more valuable now because all of a sudden they don't have to beat many Joy Veermans because all the mad buggers have all got them lined up in divisions one, yeah. division two. So I, I I just, the more I talk about it, and that's why I kind of want to have this chat as well, the more I talk about it, the more I feel like actually there's probably some cards there that just are inherently good value and just that we're, we're struggling to process that in our head to kind of apply that value to it because this stuff's got to shake out really. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just looking up there, as you were saying, so in terms of the liquidity of the secondary market, so I was just comparing sort of the first period of the year up until the announcement when that was 7th of February for up until now, and actually secondary volume's gone up by even more than 10%. So it was averaging 260K a day. Now it's averaging roughly about 300K a day. Yeah. Um, and in, in that period, you know, pre, pre-February pre 7th, from the 1st of January to February 7th from February 7th to now sort of thing. So yeah. while we might not see that, and now to be fair, there could be a, a hell of a lot more activity from, from the market makers, you know, the Pavels, et cetera, of the world. Um, but it also seems like there is a bit more. And that was one of the things that I'd said, you know, to stimulate that secondary market. Now, I think you're absolutely right. So rare. And again, we've spoken about this many times before, you know, so rare, their primary concern is the primary market and you know there's only so much so much food to go around and they want to make sure that they get fed um but uh but no you know i i think when we look at the prize pools i know you and i had had previous discussions in the last few weeks in the group chat and whatever around um you know it was didn't look that exciting and and you know there wasn't maybe that sort of jackpot feel but i, I do feel that they've they've given a far better spread now and the opportunity for users at many different levels to sort of progress in the game and, and and get those earnings and get those winnings. I still feel like maybe people are overpaying just now for the early MLS mints, but again, so rare don't necessarily mind that. Um, I yeah. do think it, it's maybe a, a bit of a short-term outlook. They could be looking at things a bit more long-term and saying, okay, guys, um, you know, Here's the lay of the land. Here's how here's how the calendar looks like, and here's how the 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 minting supply will will you know progress over the course of the season, or introduce the instant buy bit, introduce introduce the transfer window stuff. I, th- I think that just adds a bit more confidence in people like you and me going, okay, now I can buy. Now I know what I want to do. Yeah, I I think that if they could do that for the next Euro season, that would be the real the real quiz, yeah. as they would say, yeah. and uh, David Brent would say, but um because. This is a transition period, and part of that transition yeah. period is that, you know, frustrating as it is for existing users. I mean, I'm coming up sort of three months off being four years on the platform, which is wild. But, um, you know, because this is a new system and a new thing that Sora have introduced, they're still learning about it. So we're still learning about it as users, and, and they're still learning about it. And it's hard to hang your hat on certain things because you know that Sora might tweak it. So if it... Yeah. If, if, um, sort of look at it and say, like, look at how popular these MLS cards were. Actually, I don't think we actually minted enough of them. So, you know, maybe they bring out the J League ones and maybe they, they, they mint slightly more of them or maybe they just use that as their test and say, right, okay, we've managed to apply this, but maybe we could just suppress that price of them a wee bit more, but we could sell 2x or 3x of them. We get that money into the coffers and then, and then we... We we sort of flatten it out because bear in mind you're going to have um prizes coming out resale all that type of stuff as well and then you know what what for um, for me as a user what would be quite cool is if they we came to the summer and they said right you know this is how this is how many we're going to mint they just actually told you and say this yeah. is how many we're going to mint you might have the availability of instant buy which we can't quantify but this is how many we're going to actually put on the market. Um, and the instant buys 
will be how many people want to buy the instant buy. So you'll never be able to calculate that. Um, and then if everybody all goes that for it at the start of the season and is happy to pay quite a good price for it, then they get sold out quite early. Yeah. Because for me, you had the nail in the head. This is one of the things I've really been thinking of in terms of because you've got this harsh distinction between in season and not in season. You've got a really front end, I think, the supply because yeah. you're coming towards the end of the season. It's, you should probably at that point be hardly actually selling any, but still minting some as rewards. So, because yeah. yeah. people still want them for those game weeks. So, like Joe Hart's a good example, right? Joe Hart's retiring. So, yeah. he did, like everybody knows he's not going to play another game of professional football from the end of the season. But because they're still auctioning him his cards. Yeah. And still yeah. optioning them, but also people are still buying them, right? So yeah, yeah. still has a, a a value of some such. He's not. Yeah. Um, people will still buy them because they'll say, well, after the break, you know, or, or sorry, Saturday, Celtic are playing St. John's, and after the break, Celtic will get a good fixture, and we can go to the cash comps, and people will just treat it like an entry fee. So he's 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 dropped, but he's not dropped to zero, he still has a value. So there's obviously still some residual value there at the end of the season where mm -hmm. even if people feel as if they're going to become a classic card, etc., that there is a value there. But that value is vastly reduced to the value you'll get at the start of the season because you know that you're going to have 30 EPL cash comps then, or you know that you're going to have um, midweek specials, you know that you're going to have all that utility. And pe people think that that's the way people think look at championship yeah. cups. championships not an easy league to to dominate per se but you know the goalkeepers are always hell by expensive because they just play yeah. over christmas they play all the midweeks they play 40 fixtures or whatever and people look at it and go i'll pay a bit extra for that because i'll get my utility over the course of the season so and they'll pay more for it so so yeah i, I mean i don't know what your conclusion to that is my conclusion is that they probably need to much much more front end the supply sell out to users and let people spend their money on that. And, you know, that might actually, if they sell more, people will go, well, you know, it's not reaching the full price potential, but that's much better than somebody paying four or 500 quid. And then all this, the, the, the supply starts coming out and all of a sudden five, six, seven weeks later, whatever, they're 200 quid and people feel as if they're, um, yeah. this, you've got this bubble effect and stuff like yeah. that. Try yeah. and level it out. So exactly. And the and the same people that are that are, you know, spending willy nilly now to get those early mints are the same people that are gonna complain that oh you've 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 you have you have put too much out in the supply six weeks or eight weeks later or whatever it is and yeah oh so, they're so rare killing the game, they're just greedy, blah blah blah. No, like you know, you know, there's a thousand limiteds potentially, there's a hundred rares, there's ten super rares, and there's one unique of every single player on the platform. So rare are more than entitled to bring out all of those in a calendar year if they so desire. Now they haven't hit those numbers yet they haven't got near those numbers yet nowhere near unlimited still far off and rare and and still you know 60 percent of the way and super rare or or, or uh, unique but yeah I, I for me i think a front loading transfer window thing is is a good way to go but as you say you know it's a transition period i think so rare i'm sure they've got teams on this you know analyzing every little minute detail um i at least i hope they do um <laughs> you know in, in terms of, well that's <laughs> yeah, true you know? that's, that's just um, i know i know i know but you know i i hope they do because it, like this transition period is is a let's call it a grace period for them right like we are still you know yourself you just mentioned you were on the platform four years i just had a quick look it was actually my three-year anniversary yesterday i forgot that so there we go three years on as well congratulations um, Thank you, thank you. Still around uh, after a few sell-ups and a few buy-ins and a few, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, what was I going to say? Uh, the, you know, we're it's a grace period now. Like we're giving them the benefit of the doubt. We're you know, and and we're still expecting that 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 you know things can get better for the good of the game. You know, not necessarily for the individual, but for the whole community, for for everyone that everyone continues to enjoy it, continues to, um, you know engage and, and play with it um and i think they've got a lot of things right in this transition phase but i would also expect that there are some things that change from august namely i think i highly recommend on the auctioning instant buy front loading system if they can get that in action i think it just 
it, you know, it, it, it just, it stabilizes things. And I saw someone commented on my Twitter post the other day saying, oh, do you think then Sorare are controlling the market? And, you know, people don't like the sound of that, that Sorare control the market. And I definitely don't think that's the direction they're going, but we now have an idea of what prize pools are. We have an idea of what our cards can get us for our money, what we spend on them. And so naturally, you know, people will have their own reasons for outbidding or overspending and there's irrational behavior that kicks in for this, that and the other. But at the end of the day, I think that's why I haven't FOMO'd into MLS cards just yet because I'm looking at it and going, yeah, of course I'd love to build an MLS stack and I'd love to buy some cards. But for me, the price point just doesn't make sense right now. And I am yeah. assuming that that's going to come down to a more acceptable level for my sort of, you know, where I'm comfortable at, at spending on in not so far distant future. Yeah. I think that the other thing as well, just to be completely sort of transparent, you've got to throw in things like people are quite like avid collectors now. So you get those, yeah. you know, first mints. The, yeah. the, you, you get your XP advantage, obviously. So you know, if you get that head start and you get an extra level or two above where other people are going to be, that will give you an advantage because, you know, get your optimal stack and stuff like that, then that'll be an advantage. I think that when you've got confined tournaments as well, it's where it becomes quite interesting because we're quite used to playing against all the previous season cards. So so I'll give you an example. Like Say, for example, the um, next season, the start of the season, Aston Villa start the season and they play against Man City and then Liverpool and their you know their cards are just like not really that much in demand because we've got a tough start to the season. But the savvy people at that point, judging how many Sorare are going to sell or whatever, might be looking at that and going, actually games weeks three to five are Sheffield United, Luton, and Burnley. So actually, it certainly you know, won't be Sheffield United. Or Burnley. <laughs> not next season, no. <laughs> No, it'll be like Leeds and <laughs> Leicester and whatever, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah. you know, you know, people will be looking at that and there'll be, yeah. there'll be, a, there'll be a rush. And if, if we get to the start of next season in Man City play, the the version of Sheffield United that we've got at the yeah. moment at the start of the season, then there'll be huge demand for those cards. But there'll, there'll, there'll be, like, um opportunities there. Like, I, I can see where there'll be... um. Because at the moment, it's harder to move the market because you've got all those, the older season cards. So what I'm trying to explain is that you'll have more confinement because you'll have like a Premier League competition four or five weeks in where everyone's realised that there's a team that's absolutely rancid and everybody's all going to be rushing to get those cards, but you'll have hardly any supply of them. And that's why um, the new MLS cards just now are really expensive because there's demand for them because there's cash competitions. It's new where we've got this thing where there's the MLS, MLS Masters, the special, um, and, and people are um, who, who have managed to maybe sell or create a balance or win recently are funneled into them, and it's creating the supply and demand thing. So, you know, I think that that's where you'll see the sort of the true elements of sore air again, because we've been used in the past where, like, somebody really takes a view that this is a great run of fixtures or this is a great, sort of card to buy or whatever and because yeah. of the more more buyers to the cards available the price actually goes up quite quickly and that's where so rare have got quite a good mechanism of the um the one out of ten the uniques the one out of a hundred etc because if mickey yamani is just a player of the season or whatever then actually what people are paying for him just now could could act could look quite cheap but mm -hmm. um it's, it depends then what you can win in those cash comps, MLS specials, and what game weeks are running over the summer, what the specials are and stuff like that. So, so yeah, the the way um look as if we're detracting from that, but you just you just worry that maybe people actually just overpay and then a couple of weeks later they go, you know, I've not actually won anything from this guy yet, and now you can get him for one hundred and fifty quid or whatever. So that's where you've got to be really careful. But there's parts of it that kind of excite me from a level of you know if you're if you're willing to do your business at the start of the season you know you will get some game weeks where your your stack or whatever or the teams that you've picked is not getting hammered by a hundred other of the similar stacks because they won't yeah. exist in that competition because they'll be in the classic competitions um mm -hmm. and that's to take it to a different level when I, when I like say I play fan team and I play the season long thing you pick out that gem or whatever but within a week or two 
everybody's got them, you know, because yeah. it's just yeah. an overall budget and, you know, everybody can have them. So there's no limit of yeah. um, there's only 100 Cole Palmers in the pool. And if somebody's picked them at the start of the season, you're, you're selling them on for a profit. Whereas on so rare start of next season, you pick out the next Cole Palmer and you get them. They might only be 10 rares minted and everybody yeah. might them for that fixture against Sheffield United thinking he's the total gin card here because this guy's just been absolutely sensational. But you've got one of them and that's where that value comes in where you can you can choose to use them to try and win money in the cash pumps or you can choose to sell it into the demand. And um, yeah. Yeah. you know, I think you could see some really spectacular prices in some of these competitions because you've got the La Liga cash in the Bundesliga cash and you know if I were so rare I'd want to sell a thousand Bellingham next year and unlimited I would want to no. make sure I sell a thousand Bellingham so the target should be how do we sell a thousand Jude Bellinghams here in or, or 600 of them and reward 400 right yeah aye yeah, sorry yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. mint out a thousand yeah. so like exactly yeah um, get them in the price pools and stuff but also sell yeah. as many of them as possible I mean I think they'll probably they'll probably try if they can to close that ratio, like, you know, rather than seeing 60, 40, they probably want to try and sell maybe 70% of them or whatever. I don't know how that will stack up, but um, they'll probably have a lot more valuable cards to give out in the champ competitions now because just because there's so many avenues for the cash because you've got the confined EPL, La Liga and Bundesliga competition and you've got champion as well. So, yeah. you know, there's loads do you think, of... Do, do you think... I mean, I don't know. I'm only hazarding a guess, but do you think the Bundesliga and the Liga competitions will be at the same level as the Premier League in terms of prize pools? Um, I think they've got a pretty good relationship with those leagues, and I think they'll try and make yeah. them as close as po possible. Um, I think that um, when you see even the overall champion pools just now, they're they're not too far away. But the the advantage of the EPL is that you can play in champ and you can play in the EPL. So it's not so much about how close that amount is, it's just the fact that you have additional competitions for them. So like when you've yeah. seen the EPL competitions, like, you know, the one over Christmas and stuff, they were paying out like to 30 or 40 percent of entrance. So yeah. I think in an ideal world, if they get to that stage again next year, they would want more of the supply out so that they're paying out to 20 or 30 percent of people. But they've managed to sell more cards into that actual demand from users um, yeah. because you know, we don't want a scenario where every competition pays out to 10% because that's probably not healthy for overall in terms of, you know, overall users. And um, But you, you don't want a scenario where they're paying out to like half of the people that sent on for any no. given length of time because um, that no. would just create a bubble. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the 10% the I, I don't think is 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 too wild or too... You know, crazy to think that ten percent of uh of the entries win on a weekly basis, right? I think I think ten percent is an acceptable level, and that's you know there, there's only so much money going around, and and you know so we still need to make their money. So I, I think ten percent yeah. is an okay level. Um, you know, obviously, I mean, what what is it now? If you go on All Star Limited last week or whatever, I imagine. I don't know what percentage of the prize pool win, but it's, I'm sure it's pretty small, right? You know, based on the number of entries. Yeah. Um, I suppose with the, the reward boxes and stuff, it's kind of interesting because what they've done yeah. there, look, is that the 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 paying out the reward boxes down to twenty five percent or whatever. But then there's when you get a reward box, you've only got like a ten to fifteen percent chance of winning something. So it's kind of like if you don't hit the top places, you get these reward boxes and you get a chance of winning. But so it's it's including people without giving them guaranteed cash. So that 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 I think is clever. Um, but also from a sort of user's point of view, I looked at that and say you're going to get three reward boxes for top five percent or whatever, but it's just another chance at winning something yeah. and there's a sort yeah. of variation element of it. So it's so be interesting to see whether people still like that going forward, whether they just they accept that if they can't get in the top places, they'll take their chances at winning something and you know. It's probably much better than getting a crap tier five or whatever, you know. Um, I think so, that, 
Yeah, on that basis, I think looking at, I think it was the limited champion or whatever I was looking at, and based on on the the reward boxes or whatever we call them, you could place, so say you place in the top 10 and you're getting a T0 anyway, you get the star reward for in the top 10, right? And then you get three of those elite boxes, which each have a 6% chance or something of getting a, a T0 as well. Yeah. You could come ninth in limited champion, and you could come away with four tier zeros in one week. Like yeah. the, it, it's not a zero percent chance. It's a more than zero percent chance. You know, yeah. and, and also you could come two thousand five hundred and sixty eighth, and come away with a T zero out of your reward box. So I think yeah. you know, I think they're they're a very very good um introduction, and it, you know that 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 allows that jackpot feeling to exist. I think uh, let's not get into rewards and tears just now because I know that's a whole other topic of conversation. How many hours have we got today, Mike? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but, but I, uh, I do, I don't want to cut across you, but I do like that. And the example I was used because the poker's booming just now, and I, I don't play much poker, right? But I see these competitions are doing mystery bounty competitions. You knock somebody out, and then what happens is a half in the prize pool. So half the prize pool goes to, you know, what place you finish in. But then there's this element of this uh, jackpot bounty. So like mm. you know, Sunday Million or whatever in Poker Stars, like somebody's going to win a one hundred thousand dollar bounty. So it's creating that excitement mm. of every time you knock somebody out and you open that box, you've got this random chest where you could win mm. a certain amount of thousand dollar prizes and that type of stuff. So you know, mm. um, actually, I think that what they've done is extremely clever because at the end of the day, platforms are not just about me or Pranksy or Nanzo, or the guys at the top end. It's also about giving everyone the feeling that there's a competitive environment and they can win yeah. something good. Yeah, so, and you've got to be in it to win it. Well, that's it. And, you know, if you get yourself into the top 25, like my brother plays, right? He's got a very small gallery um, and he, he's got his Celtic cards. And more recently, he's, because things are cheaper, he'd be able to buy some good cards limited to 10, 20 quid. But if I can say to him, look, if you come in the top 25%, you do have a chance of winning an Mbappe yeah. or a Belling or whatever. He'll love that because he's not wanting to be plowing money in all the time, but he does enjoy playing the game. Um, he enjoys every so often winning his 10 or his 20 quid, being able to buy some good cards, and he enjoys being able to put his teams in and stuff. So obviously yeah. big adjustments for everybody, but like from his point of view, if he can get into a percentage and have a good weekend, and even have the chance of opening something that gives them a chance, whilst we might look at that and go, are oh, you unique? We're in the top 25%, then you've only got a 10% chance, and it's quite random, but it does give everybody a chance of picking something up, and, and I really do think that that'll, that'll help the, the market mm. overall, giving some yeah. people something to play for or aim for, or giving them the chance of having that big um, yeah. weekend. So... And maybe that's where the excitement will come back a lot, you know, because you'll have somebody going on Twitter going, you know, came thousandth and and champion or whatever, and of of yeah. one and Mbappe, you know, and they'll be like, yeah. that's that guy's going to be buzzing out. He's been, you know, he's going to be like absolutely amazing. But you know, if everybody gets that feeling of, well, I've still got a chance of doing this. I don't have to enter three teams to come in the top three and take my chance that way. I I, I do have a genuine chance, albeit. It's just like a, t a ticket into the yeah, top exactly. yeah. out. It's still fun, right? So yeah, yeah, and you know, I, like you say, you got to be in it to win it. If you don't have a team in in each yeah. division or in each competition or whatever, you're not going to have a chance there at that. So that that sort yeah. of stimulates stimulates you know purchases and more cards and whatever. Go back to the go back to the Bellingham one. I just wanted to run it by you and get your thoughts as well. You know, the example yeah. you were saying, you know, they want to get a thousand Bellinghams out next year. Yeah. And what I'd written about a couple of weeks ago with this sort of instant buy format would sort of be on a demand basis. So you might end up minting the whole supply of Bellinghams because people want Bellinghams, but uh, take a behind you, Kyogo, right? Only yeah. only 400 people want the, want the Furuhashi. So there's only 400 Furuhashis minted, but there's a thousand Bellinghams minted. Yeah. But then, you know, I don't know exactly how the relationship, uh, the licensing works with the leagues and the clubs and whatever. I'm of an understanding that there is some sort of revenue share model that, you know, the, the clubs get a percentage of, of sales that are made by Surair. And then that puts Celtic in a position to start pushing their fan base to say, hey, 
buy our cards, buy our team players. You know, this is, you know, here's our star performers. Here's our, and actually in a reverse way, so rare get the clubs to sort of do the marketing for them because they're incentivized for every more, every other card that is bought on, on a specific club basis where they're actually, you know, generating, you know, profits from that. I, I think that's a really quite clever way to go. I quite like it. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but you could end up with a thousand Bellinghams and only 10 of some random no name that nobody wants and nobody likes. Yeah, I, I think the first thing to say with that is that they ought to be able to mint a lot more of the top stars than you would do in the contender leagues or the rest <laughs> as we've been like, known as at the moment. But like you, you will and you know, you've know just got to be careful that you don't end up with a huge variation like in terms of supply and individual ones. So you, you wouldn't want a scenario where maybe you end up with like um, 400 Furuhashis minted, but then in the other contender regions, there's only like 50 of some of the other cards because then that would be like completely unfair. So that's that's where you, you you you've got to be careful with it that you're keeping like um like reasonable boundaries. You know, what do you yeah. do if, for example, everybody all goes mental on the instant buys and buys food of hashes, but then there's double the amount of his cards and there are the other cards in contender. But with um But that's but that's then that's only on a demand basis. If if other cards start picking up in form that their demand will ramp up, and the, instant, will rise, they, the, yeah. the instant buy will cater to that, and, and yeah, the price yeah. will rise accordingly, and whatever. And then yeah. Kyogo, you know, does his ACL or you know is injured for a while, it basically stops supply. <laughs> no, hopefully not. A bad example, but do you know what I mean? Like yeah. if someone yeah, yeah. If someone were to get injured, the demand yeah. drops, and then the price gradually, slowly trickles down up until a point where someone's saying, "Okay, yeah, I'm willing to purchase his card now because I know he's going to be back in three months or whatever." Yeah, I think that like. So the, the problem with so rare more had just now was probably like they had weekends where they're maybe over rewarding cards and you know like but that that still you can apply that back to this sort of theory as well because what happens if people buy cards for a specific run and then they want to sell them after it so a good example would be Christmas because you know um in the UK you've got games over Christmas when a lot yeah. of leagues take a break so you know say you've got your instant buy there everybody's hammer and instant buy for Furuhashi but then. Scotland have taken a break in January and everybody's trying to get rid of those cards because then they want to go into their strategy of the guys who are coming back from Bundesliga and things. So, you know, that's where, you know, when you're allowing the instant buys that maybe so rare need to be careful of what sort of limit on how many they'll sell of those. What, mm -hmm. what, you know, yeah. do they just keep selling instant buys and just say, this is magic, we've sold 20 rares on a day or do they put a certain amount of instant buys in and then there's a time lapse where those instant buys here again and that's where your transfer window model is quite interesting and I, I like that model but you know will everyone all have their money available in April yeah. you know will, uh, have, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Will, will there be a budget have to stretch across the year where you might think well okay I want to buy like my goalkeeper for Celtic and I want to buy my Cameron Carter Vickers in August but I might not be able to afford those other pieces until later on you know because I just don't have the money as front end yeah. at the start of the season to say that's my whole stack I want so um, yeah. but I, I think that what you're saying about Bellingham and stuff and I, I think that a lot of people maybe struggle to get their head around this but there's, there's a lot more chance that Soria could sell and mint a thousand Bellingham and he would maintain his price than there would be of Joe Bloggs because yeah. you know your lower down tiers and yeah. other leagues that don't carry the same interest level will never be as popular as your top stars. So even with the EPL guys, you would still find that there was guys who didn't really score that well, but they were still selling at a good level just because people wanted to play in the EPL and they maybe they were newer to the game and they, they didn't want to delve into like the Asian leagues and stuff and make a humongous mistake. So yeah. you know you. you you will have that scenario where you might have to, sorry, I might have to judge that supply on different levels of the game because they're really putting a lot of the best cash rewards and stuff into the top five champion leagues. And you know, yeah. maybe at some point they'll they'll get the whole of France as well and we'll actually have a, a fourth um cash comp and stuff there. And then they'll say, well, okay, we'll, we'll now have the cash comp there and, and they'll really have to drive out cards towards that for those competitions as well. So you might have variations between um, champion, challenger, 
in contender. Um, and yeah. maybe it would make more sense to actually sell less contender cards just to retain some more value in them. And if they're selling thousands of Bellinghams and thousands of Hallands and all that type of stuff, it might not actually matter as much because that's where they're going to make their their money, you know, um, yeah. at the end of the day, yeah. the most popular leagues. So... Um, and and we we have those one thousand one hundred ten and one ceilings, right? And and you know we know we know things can't exceed that. And so in a way, you know maybe there's an element of so rare. I don't know what their sort of user user growth projections are like or what their plans are in that in that scope as well. But you know there is an element of they want to hold some back because you know they 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 expect growth to come and they expect prices to, uh, you know. Uh, maintain at a, at a certain level because uh new year's is entering and, and they can sort of hold at that level as opposed to if they mint loads early and then we're selling on the secondary you know and it's and it's actually the users that are getting that that gain rather than so rare themselves or so rare only getting five percent of it um so there's an element there and there's a there's a give and take from them but but i do think there's a middle ground it can be fine you know yeah, I think the other interesting thing is if you get a lot of the supply out at the start of the season and then there's active trading, then Soraya will get like their 100 quid for their limited card plus their 5% per transaction. So you yeah. get the, the, the cards out at the start of the season, you'll get all that resale revenue on it as well. And ultimately, whilst we don't always like that as users, we're, we are reliant on Soraya putting that money into the prize pools and stuff. So if they can make profit on that, then and they know that's sustainable and a work yeah. a worthwhile workable model, then that might help us in the future as well. Because the next season you might say, well, prize pools are going up 10% or 15% because we know this actually works. So there's there's got to be a trade-off there. And what I really do like about the model and which doesn't suit me as an existing user is that one of the blockers just now is that if people come in, you say, right, well, you want a rare team, you've got to spend like 1,500 quid or 2,000 pounds. But then... They're having to compete with existing users who have a knowledge advantage. They have a gallery size advantage, etc. They have a collection bonus advantage. So, you know, there's a real card disadvantage. Whereas with us, you can see somebody who comes in and they really like it and say, well, I'm going to spend two or 300 quid. But actually, at the start of the season, they'll have the same chances of winning something in the EPL competition as anybody else. Because, yeah. uh, okay, if people still regard me as having an advantage because I win the money for the game and still spend 300 quid to enter. But if I'm spending 300, 300 quid to enter, that, you know, I've, I've got the same chances of winning that competition out with knowledge as, as somebody else. Yeah. And they have a good weekend. They, they win their $1,000 for first or whatever. Then they've trounced me in that weekend. Um, so yeah. I think that that's good because people don't really believe just now that the, the, the hordes are going to come into the game, but yeah. far more chance of that happening under this model because there were Definitely. problems with the old, old model that just had to be solved, really. Yes, yeah. and in, in, in an ironic way, even though it might not seem like it when people are paying 5x for new season MLS cards, it actually is now turned to a version where you know it's rewarding people who are better at the game rather than people who are just stumping up cash, yeah. and that doesn't sound like it on the, on the face of it, but or not stumping up cash, but those, you know, the, the significant galleries, you know, the, the Nanzos and the Pranksies of this world. And whatever. Pranksy's a bit different because he's relatively new in or they're relatively new in and, and doing a lot. But, you know, listen to Nanzo on, on Laird the other day and I thought it was quite interesting, his take in terms of he's actually a little bit uh, despondent or, or not not so attracted at, at jumping into in-season just now because um, he sort of feels like, hey, you know, I've I've I've... I've paid my dues. I've been around the block. I've done this. You know, I I can earn very well as as it comes. Um, and he didn't love the fact that 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 you know, so rare basically asking him to put his hand in his pocket every year. Um, which, to be fair, I can understand. Um, but then as you say, that allows someone else. If if Nanzo isn't going to do it, someone else is going to put their hand in their pocket and beat him. Yeah, and the other thing as well is he still has his chance to play in the classic competitions and win that. So yeah. Anzo's the type of guy who's so good that within yeah. a month or two in the season, he will have some teams that he's just won from those old cards um, and yeah. he'll be entering and he'll be doing well. And whether he puts money to that or he try and works with his existing gallery, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm obviously the same and I know that you're never going to be able to just like, use your cards forever or whatever, but it's just to take the conversation on. So I don't know how much time you've got left roughly, but why talk about like strategy going forward and how you can work with those things. So mm -hmm. my main reaction just now is I'm just I'm just 
desperate to go back to under 23s because I see lots of advantages with the under 23s. The first advantage under 23s to me is it's the only all star competition that's really going to remain. So, you know, you get your guy and you buy your guy who's playing in French League 2. You buy your goalkeeper, you spend 20 quid on him, he ends up becoming a starter, he's doing really well. He's then in a team where you can win Jude Bellingham. Now, in contender, one of the main reasons I would buy my Celtic cards and stuff would be I know there would be game weeks where I had a real good run at All Star um, yeah. and won really quite good prizes. And that's not going to be there anymore unless Celtic continue to buy guys who are under 23. So, like Luis Palma, for example, was a great card for a while. Yeah. But he's, he's also timing out, and there's other factors where he's lost his place. But what I'm really getting at here is, you know, from my own point of view, I'm really, I'm really proper attracted by the under twenty threes again because, you know, if I go back to limited, for example, and I say right, I'm going to play the under twenty threes at limited, I know that actually if I do have a couple of good game weeks, I might actually win some Sackers or some Bellinghams, but also they are really good for the cash comps as well. Yeah. So yeah. I find that really interesting because I think that the younger players in the game really have a real, a, a real good store of value, and even if they do fall quite a lot when they become 24 they still have like six or seven or eight years of classic competitions so my, my strategy I think is going to be that if I'm going to be making significant buys or whatever I want to get guys who I can play in the under 23s because then I, yeah. I can still have an aspiration of winning a sack or whatever and a sack will help me in the under 23s but also he'll help me in any competition at the moment because he's that yeah. good He's, yeah. He plays across quality. He's going to the Euros. He's champion. He's in the EPL competition. So, so I think that by retaining the under twenty threes, um, I'm really glad about that because that's one of the tipping points for me in terms of sticking around. You know, I, I like buying a guy and saying, okay, I'm I'm going to follow that guy's career. I know he's got three years left in the under twenty threes. I know that after that, I'll have ongoing utility, and I want to see how he does, and and I'll spend more to buy those guys than I would do just buying somebody just now just to win the MLS weekly in the next three weeks. That's just my yeah. view on strategy. So um yeah. I just think I know you're maybe quite excited if if you you know it'd be great for example if we'd had summer leagues and stuff like you know the still yeah. um hopefully with um Soria Mint and Palmeiras maybe they've got a deal where they could mint some more Brazilian cards over the summer, that would be awesome because you get some outrageous talents coming out of Brazil. But we have that kind of gap where you just don't have as many good game weeks over the summer, excluding the Euros. So how are you feeling about how you want to spend your money going forward? Yeah, and I, I like the under-23 uh, point. I come back to that. But yeah, so I, I bought up a few uh, Brazil classic cards now just because I, I quite like the seasonality of it, you know, in yeah. terms of, of the calendar year where it falls. I went for players that also have uh, either uh, Sudamericana or uh, the Bernadores sort of games. So, you know, it gives me a bit of that spread. What I am concerned or worried about is not only those European games are, are not European, the continental games, but also a lot of Brazilian uh, league fixtures will fall midweek as well. They play quite a few games sort of on, on Wednesdays and stuff. And I don't know if they're going to open Challenger for that um, or if it's going to be reliant upon special weeklies. I think they will, but only if there's at least 10 teams playing. So I think I know the answer to this because I asked Momo about the under 23s and it relates to whether or not they're league fixtures. So if you have if you have um the Brazilian Serie A is running on a Wednesday mm. and there's ten teams, then Challenger will be open for that because it's a league fixture. But if right. they're playing in the Sudamericana or whatever, yeah, yeah. will then be the special weekly version of it because then they're in the intercontinental competition. So okay. I okay. think that's quite good if you maybe apply that example to say the championship, you know, say they, they got the license for the championship and they had loads of championship teams. That'd be really good because you know that maybe if the championship's running midweek, you yeah. have your cash comps and everything open. Yeah. So I think that, that that actually the way they've done that. The only thing I don't like about special weeklies is this circa two weeks notice type thing because that's how to plan for. So I know. 
Yeah, yeah, I think yeah that that's going to be difficult, and I I don't love that myself as well because you know there there are always you know there's always opportunities in midweek, and there's obviously been a big focus on on the new structure on a on a on a weekend basis, right? Friday to Tuesday game weeks happening, but then this Tuesday to Friday game week uh, going forward, how is that going to look, and and what are we going to do there? And and if it's like you say, if it's a two week window doesn't really give people either there's going to be a mad rush for cards or people are just going to have, you know, buyer's regret when they've mad rushed for cards, hasn't paid off for them, and then they're stuck with a card that they don't want or don't need, don't use long-term. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure how I feel about the midweeks right now. I hope I hope, I hope, we get a little bit more clarity on that and, um, you know, a little bit more guidance on on how it's going to look. Um, but, yeah, no, Brazil, I'm, I'm quite excited for the seasonality of Brazil. I really like your under twenty three thought as well. Um, I mean, if you look, I mean, you go back two years, like under twenty three was the competition, wasn't it? I mean, the the buzz around so rare two years ago was all about U twenty threes, and you know the price of U twenty threes were, you know, three four x. You know, U twenty three goalkeepers were few and far between, and their price was ridiculous compared to the best goalkeepers in the world that were playing in Champ Europe at the time. Um, and like that, that excitement, like you say, that could be could be a really nice niche. Now, again, a niche is only a niche if there's only a few people doing it, and so you know it, it can become it can become a a, a trend, and, and everyone's playing U twenty three, but that, that that's not a bad thing at all. I don't think so. I mean, because that you still need to have that element of where people are looking to follow somebody's kind of career. And yeah. I remember like yeah. the talk about the football index. Sorry, guys, I know some a lot of people lost money in that. How did I? But with that, even though it was supposed to be a three year bet, people were like, you know, really looking at um guys like Sancho and thinking about over his career. And there was arguments about how you should value that person. But at the end of the day, people really loved that. Um, and for me, with under twenty threes, our thing is clarification because I did specifically ask this question: is that the under twenty threes will be open in midweeks where? Other competitions are open in challenger, champion, or yeah, okay. um, contender. So, if you have, for example, a midweek where you've got SPFL fixtures, you've got five games, so you've got ten licensed teams from Scotland. The under twenty threes will also open that week because it's league fixtures yeah. and because contender opens. So you'll still have those game weeks where you'll have under twenty threes and stuff. Now they might link it back and make it a bit more difficult to. To win the top stars in those because they seem to be like kind of like more going towards trying to make the rewards um tailored to the teams that are playing in those weeks and stuff. So there mm. could be things that okay. maybe don't quite sort of stack up there. But if they if they they can leave the under twenty threes as much as the classic mode as possible, I don't think you need the the cash version under twenty threes because you know you've you've got three times entry, so if you'll get limited at the moment. You can only enter once. So you get yeah. three times the demand and limited. If you look at rare, you had the rare and the rare plus. So the rare plus is going, but then you've got three entries to rare. So you've got thirty three percent more of the demand in rare, and in super rare you've got sixty percent. You've got the same as limited because you've got super rare under twenty threes, and now you're going to have three entries super rare under twenty threes. Yeah. So that that's going to create a lot of demand for younger cards. And again, my main point of that I think is just that. For me, that's a competition where I can put my pieces together and aspire to win the Bellinghams and the Hallands and stuff like that. But by getting, yeah. you know, Kuryu Matsuki from um, Tokyo or Araki or guys like that who are good under 23 players on the platform, but normally in their contender division can't win a champion card. So that that's going to be my main kind of, I think I just like the way I think as an existing user, that's um, where what he kind of play. And, and I think that, there's a huge skill base in that division as well because it, it regenerates, right? So, you know, you've got an instant card burner in there because, you know, they're really, Diogo Costa's, like, his price really fallen off a cliff, right? He's still really valuable, but it's because he's not an under 23 goalkeeper next year. So his price has really fallen and he's he's great and he's such a good goalkeeper and all that type of stuff. But now, actually, people want him to move to the EPL yeah. all of a sudden. So it's really yeah. changed that whole dynamic. Well, that, that that's exactly it and you know like you say you know picking up a u23 and being able to follow them in their careers that develop and transfer clubs but also the, the the fact that we have this tiering and i know you you obviously we don't love that, that the spfls and contender and whatever but you know if you look at it on the whole isn't it really cool that 
back in the day when a challenger player moved to a championship club, he, he often dropped in value because people were like, oh dear, he's not going to play as well there. He's not going to have as many high dark green scores, whatever. Now, if you look at it, I mean, I'm trying to think there's many examples, but like Junya Ito, you know, started his career in Japan in, in contender, went to challenger, did well at Genk. Now he's in France doing well in champion. Like his card becomes more valuable as his career progresses. Um, and you know, there's multiple, many, many, many examples like that. And I think the 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 game again is now set up in a better way for that. So yeah. I think that I think that does make more sense um to not to us, but it makes more sense yeah. to someone from the outside world who comes in who thinks, well, yeah. actually now that they're playing in that top league, okay, their scores might drop a wee bit, but it helps preserve some of the value in the card and stuff. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that that's all such a big change for everybody that we all have to just get our, our heads around all that type of stuff. And I might do actually a separate video for the, the channel just on what I've been doing, but I've been buying loads of young rare goalkeepers. I mean, I just don't, I, I just don't think that people have um, factored in the fact that, um, that if you don't want to play in a certain area, you could just um, have three teams in the same competition or whatever. And goalkeepers naturally, that will bring a lot of um, demand back for goalkeepers just because only one goalkeeper per team. Um, and if yeah. people might not like that, and so goalies are expensive again and stuff, but at the end of the day, there has to be some elements of things where so they are quite profitable as well. And if goalkeepers are expensive, everybody's like, um, you know, they, be they become a higher level of card that people just got to have to pay or whatever, then, you know, so they'll make some profit there as well. So it is yeah. what it is from that point of view. I don't think, so I really need to mess about with stuff like that because forward cards have always been historically quite expensive as well, you know, because there's not as many forwards as quite over packed with mids and more mids playing per team. So you've just got some natural supply and demand economics there that so rare should just allow it to happen. And if some of them are more expensive, so be it. People just need to adapt to that and um play accordingly type thing. But I think it gives some really good opportunity um with 23 has been classic where you can buy an 18 year old goalkeeper and he turns out to be the next Lucas Chevalier or um, the next Diogo Costa or whatever. That's you set up for a couple of seasons. You either take your profit and say, okay, people are paying 300 quid for that guy, I'm going to sell him. Or you just get your usage out of it and say, okay, I've got that guy there. Yeah. I'm going to use him wherever it, it suits me um, sort of going forward. And all right, I'll not be in the season, but it doesn't matter in under 23s. So that's what I like about it. You can take a more longer term view than I'm just aiming at that cash pump for the next couple of months. I'm actually want to play every weekend in the odd midweek over the next two or three seasons and and just sort of plan accordingly. And I, I find that really fun. I mean I, like I think there's an element of just saying I'm just gonna go and buy a an Arsenal stack at the start of the season is not as much fun as no. um, finding the next guy who's gonna be the Lucas Chevalier or whatever, you know. So yeah. that that, yeah. that really yeah. interests me. So I agree. And the under 23, you've all, like, like you said earlier, you know, there's, there's more utility. So for, if, if there's a hundred of a, uh, take a Jude Bellingham versus a Tony Kroos as an example, right? If there's the same amount of cards minted, you can use your Bellingham in U23 and Champ and uh, La Liga whenever it comes. Mm -hmm. Whereas you can only use Tony, Tony Kroos in two of those competitions. So Bellingham's yeah. going to be spread out across more as well, you know, so there's, there's less chance of coming up against the, the, the the elite cards as well in, in those uh, champ and Premier League and whatever competitions. So yeah, I, I like it. I think I might yeah, start people... just putting a little so rare data search on U23 players now. <laughs> yeah. Well I mean uh, people don't always like it, but then you know like if you look at guys like Pranksy or whatever, it's really driving demand in certain levels because you'll see that um people who are willing to spend are quite happy to have the big gallery and know that they'll have their extra entries. Um mm. You know, so it is what it is from that point of view, whether people agree with that or not. But, like, you know, back to the threshold, like, you know, people were, like, creating additional accounts and multi-account in the threshold. And, you know, everybody knew that it, it was it was going to happen in some way because it was so attractive. And it's quite hard for so rare to prevent those things because, you know, it's, it's a full-time job of somebody actually sitting looking at those things. So the, the new system is more sort of challenging and less scammable because, you yeah. know, why would you want to create four accounts or whatever now? Because you, you know, if you really want to play the game to an extent where you've got extra entries, then you know yeah. three entries per division, and you just play that within the game. So you know, at the end of the day, it's meaning that hopefully the guys who are doing it to a good level are 
are doing it within their own accounts, but in a competitive environment, not an environment where it's this sort of um, beat the game easy type environment, you know, and yep. the current version of beat the games, you know, I think is is okay. It does your head in sometimes, but it's, it's obviously still paying out, but also it's yep. still kind of rewarding. So we'll see what happens sort of going forward. But um, yeah, so there's yeah. many things to factor in just now. And one of those things, I think the secondary market is just that people are just changing strategy just now and that's driving prices down. So I think there's huge amounts of value that we were always every time somebody mentions in the group chat a Brazilian player and we're buying like the Lisa Rojo <laughs> rare for 16 quid and you're going that is just ridiculous price for a guy of that quality at Flamengo and stuff like that. But there there definitely is um yeah. value about there as people just forget about that element of things and they just focus on certain things that drives demand to another area. Um and that's that's part of the fun the fun of it really is, is try to pick up that something you think is just yeah. ultra good fun value yeah. look forward that type of stuff that's it i mean that's what i said you know when this was first announced like what what i was most excited for and i'm not good for it because i can't make my mind up yet but i'm most excited for <laughs> hearing strategies of what people are going to do because i feel like with this new model there are just so many different paths you can take and so many different ways you can play yeah. the game now. And, and you know, that that is only a good thing, right? People can do as they please and still come out of it happy the other end. Um, and so, you know, I'm really excited to see what 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 you guys do, what, you know, a lot of the content creators out there and, and just generally what, what people are going to take and what routes they're going to do. And, you know, some people are going to trip up and some people are going to have great success and, and you know, it's going to be fun along the way. So, I think, yeah, so rare of... I've laid the foundation now. It's definitely, uh, uh, yeah, still a transition phase, although I don't know how much change we're really going to see come August. I think when it comes to card supply, we might see some stuff, um, but the actual, the, the gameplay and the formats and the prize pools, I'll be interested to see if there is a new beat the game format in some way um, or whether they keep this, you know, the three targets, the low, mid, high, or what they do. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, I think divisions will, will really help that as well because I don't yeah. think people really realise the value of divisions. Like one thing that's really struck me because I'm trying to get my head around how Celtic's been affected by this, but one thing that really I hadn't hadn't factored in myself to that thousand dollars for first in contender is that I, you know okay I still play against um one at second and then go Vicente and all that the, the guys who are quite good in the secondary divisions but also I don't have to play any Bruno Fernandes I don't have to play any um, Jude yeah. Berlin I don't have to play any of those cards and actually one thing that's quite interesting about the, the high end champion type cards is that one of their real values is that they're so consistent like if you look at Mbappe Mbappe can go and runs yeah. and he just plays awesome for like 20 and 30 games but when you when you flip that back and you look at contender Celtic's value, I think, is that Celtic beat teams every week. Um, yeah. Whereas you look at some teams in Holland where they're popular stacks, you know, people maybe get like 20 stacks and all that type of stuff. But 20 could go five or six games without having a real good SO5 performance. So yeah. all of that stuff all needs to be factored in. But I do think that, um, well, next season, it's going to save me a wee bit of money in my Celtic collections. So maybe that will actually be good. Yeah. Divorce status with the wife. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you, know, you, know, you never know if, if the irrationality of users continues this trend that we're seeing with MLS. You never know what the Celtic new season cards are going to go for. <laughs> who knows? Um, I mean, it, it is really interesting yeah. from that point of view, but um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe there'll be really good value there. I mean, like, maybe a scenario where, like, I actually all of a sudden, you know, can afford like a new season. Celtic and um, rare collection, and I'm looking beyond that and thinking, well, actually, maybe I should be buying like you know two of these or whatever, you know, like um, mm -hmm. you know, because my my edge with Celtic is like you know I do the play sharper and everything, so like I've got I've, I've got the best knowledge of I think yeah. the best knowledge of um how to plan or how to buy those cards or which ones to buy because sometimes you see guys buying a Celtic card and go, oh you know like you're, yeah this guy scores pretty well and so rare but you know a couple of weeks from that guy's back he's not going to be playing so I've got that advantage of if I want to funnel my sort of knowledge and my money ultimately into that I think I've got quite a big sort of edge so it might make sense then for me to carry extra versions of those cards because I can enter Division 1 and 2 or I can enter twice or or whatever. Yeah. So so it really um 
throws out loads of different um, avenues and strategies and yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's, I mean that's that's what I've done now for Brazil to a lesser extent for I mean we're still sort of what is it six weeks away from the season starting or whatever but I think I've got like 15 rare cards just now I'll probably top up with a few more and that's going to give me three lineups in classic um, and I, I can just pick and choose, prioritize each week. So, okay, you know, this goalkeeper defender has a good matchup this week. So they go in my, the the best division lineup, wherever division I end up in. And, you know, I've got a pool of, say, 20, 25 cards there where I can go, okay, I can actually choose lineup one. That's my best option. Lineup two, then lineup three. Um, yeah. Or in some instances, I, I don't really know yet how it's going to work, but does it make sense to prioritize your second lineup to get it promoted um, where your first lineup is going to stay where it is or whatever? You know, I, I don't really know how that's going to work yet, but yeah, I'm give, giving myself the options. Yeah, because I think like the second division looks like the, the, the prizes are pretty good, but you'll have more users in there. So you'll have naturally yeah. more sort of variance in the scores, more combinations, etc. So you know, people might think it's better to play the better lineup in the lower divisions, but actually, depending on the game week or whatever, yeah. that probably won't um, yeah. lie. Yeah. And, it, you know, yeah. I did, I mean, people always ask me, like, you know, but playing limited and stuff. And the, the real thing with all this was that I've, got, I've still got lots of cards, which is a fortunate position to be in. But with all these strategy things going on, I, I just thought my head's going to get fried with all these different limited teams and strategies and when I should sell guys and stuff and I really wanted to kind of cut down some of the volume so that I could kind of focus on that and also I do think that you know with rares and things that often they can become undervalued in themselves because when people play limited etc and they see that um, limited is uber competitive naturally if they want to continue to play the game they, they might then move up so yeah. you, know, you do get spells where limited starts popping off and you just think rares are just so undervalued here because people start winning some money at that level naturally they might not want to enter more limited teams they might want to aspire to moving up the scarcities and have more money to win or have rare collections or whatever so um so yeah from that perspective i think like my main sort of like strategy is going to be focused towards rare but trying to really like solidify having some really good super rare lineups um and with a view to winning those new season ones and or, or whatever, you know, because I'm never going to be in a position, I'm not a millionaire or whatever, right? So I'm not never going to be in a position where I'm just going to be saying I'm going to put in an extra 20 or 30,000 every August, but I will always back myself to win enough of those cards to either make my existing collections profitable or allow me to continue to play um, in new seasons. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of, you know, mostly the reason I'm still sticking about, to be honest, not just like... um not just sort of thrown in the towel because I know a lot of people have thrown in the towel or maybe they were just saying well yeah I'd rather just take the gamble that Ethereum goes up and everything but that is a gamble in itself you know the current Ethereum price could be the the next high for the next year or whatever somebody yeah. sell up just now so yeah Ethereum's going to 10,000 and everything and they they take their money and they leave it in Ethereum and next week Ethereum's dropped 30% you know there's volatility yeah. in that and you know yeah um, ups and ups and downs and all that so do you see do you see there i'd love to know like get your opinion on and i'll need to wrap up soon you have a meeting in 10 minutes but yeah, um no the uh um you, you were talking about sort of super air and and you know you've got some uniques and whatever and, and what, what are your sort of thoughts on strategy and acts i'm just looking here right and if i go to the blog the rare in-season contenders division one first place is a thousand bucks and the uh, super rare in season contenders is thirteen hundred. Yeah. Does that does that inspire you? Say you didn't have any super rares, and you're doing really well in rare, and you're starting to build a bit of a balance. Does it inspire you to jump up the super rare with the cost differential if the prize winning is pretty marginal? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where maybe they've got to look at it. I mean, the interesting thing is, they said, well, you can buy a super rare and you can use it as lower scarcity, but like. You know, to say you've got Bruno Fernandez rare, you know, like Bruno Fernandez super rare is going for like six X or whatever. Like you're not going to place pay six X and then use it no. for any length of time as being a rare. Um, equally, you're not going to buy a super rare, a tier three ish super rare, and say I'm going to use that in rare because you know at the end of the day you just buy the rare version or whatever. So I I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if that's where maybe they have misjudged it from point of view of the beat the game dynamics maybe. 
are more required than the top the more top divisions you know and yeah. um, from my point of view like having no divisions in unique's a huge problem like you know unique it's, it's okay like you used the example of Frank saying he's spending all his money but when he wins a tier three unique or whatever he needs somebody to want to buy that card exactly so, yeah. unless exactly. so rare change what they're planning there there'll be no buyers of the lower end cards because not, nobody's going to buy a tier four unique and say, well, that's fine. I'm going to use it as a super rare. I, I don't see that happening. So I think there's points in there they've got to sort out. And they've got time till August yeah. because you've yeah. still got the caps running just now. But I don't think one division is going to work very well there. So it's going to be interesting. But I do think that um, what people don't really see in super rare is that sometimes you get quite a good stack or whatever and there's, there's cards that are doing well and the scarcity really kicks in. So you get yourself a really good yeah. super rare goalkeeper or whatever, then that'll become really valuable again. And the, the, these guys who play at a certain level who they've got millions in and things won't hesitate to say, well, I want three stacks in or whatever, and they'll be coming after those cards. So the classic competitions could be a lot more relevant there because you just don't you just don't have the same level of supply that you, you have in, in rare. Um, yeah. That old Vanekin's been on the platform for so many years, but still only like 30 super rares exist and stuff. So still a really tight supply. And I think that um finding some real nuggets there in terms of the classic cards will still be be yeah. really, really relevant there. So yeah. So there we go. Anyway, I know you've got a meeting coming up soon. Thanks very yeah. much for joining me again. It's been really good um just to get a catch up and hopefully um for the viewers, etc. It will give people a wee bit of an insight into things going forward. But sometimes people panic about their existing gallery values and all that type of stuff. But I think that there's, you know, my take from this is that there's still real areas of the market that are pretty undervalued. And, you know, yeah. if people feel as if they're still capable of winning, et cetera, they should, they should plug away and um, continue to enjoy the game. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. There's, uh, yeah, as you say, there's, there's, more than more than one way someone can win at the game. So I think it's it's going to be fun to see what people do over the coming months. Um and you know it's especially going to be fun once we have a bit more of a a settled outlook on things, you know, when when August kicks in or hopefully you know we get an update a bit before August kicking in. But um you know what it's going to look like going forward when new new European season cards come out and and what we do from there. But I'm excited. Good stuff. Thanks so much for joining us again. I'm sure we'll catch up in future, Mike. Have a good day. Thanks, Mark. Sounds okay. good. See you again. Have a good day. Cheers. Bye-bye.